A good Wednesday evening to you. This is our Oasis service here. I'm Pastor Jones, and this is Valley Assembly of God in Hagerstown, Maryland. Welcoming you to a time in God's Word, and uh, once again, I hope you have brought your Bible in hand, and let's uh, get into God's Word together as we're in a brand new study uh, that we've been into a few weeks now, talking about the danger lines in the deeper life. And you know, it is God's intent that every one of us go deeper in God. He's never wanted, nor does he expect us to, to remain uh, in shallow territory. Uh, that's a problem in the church world today. We're about two miles wide and about a half inch deep, shallow. We need some depth. We need to set down some roots. We need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So these studies are so important, and uh, we're going to be reading something from the book of Hebrews in just a moment, the 11th chapter, if you want to take your Bibles and turn to it, but also making reference to Judges 3 and 31 and Judges 4, 14 and 15, as we talk about conquering through faith, conquering through faith. Now, while you're turning, let me just remind you, we'll be back here Sunday morning at 9 o'clock with the Bible study hour. 10 o'clock is morning worship uh, with children's ministries. And then, of course, we're back here Sunday night, 6 o'clock, for our Sunday evening service. Royal Rangers and Girls Ministries are going on. Monday's prayer meeting at 12 noon. And then we're back here Wednesday night for our midweek oasis service, 7 o'clock. We have the youth group meets, children's ministries meet. And, of course, after a time of praise and worship, uh, we dive into God's Word. And we hope that you'll join us so very soon. The Bible says here in Hebrews... 11, 32 through 34. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut up the mouth of lions, quenched the uh, fire the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned into strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies we want to talk about conquering through faith and I, I, I want to set the scene by saying a couple things here that I think that you can relate to and you understand the darkness of night allows us to see the stars. Similarly, it seems that the darkest times of national and church history are always occasions for the best types of genius and character to shine. I was reading the other day, and I shared some time ago with the congregation, I was rereading a portion of Jonathan Edwards' biography. 1740 was the year in one man writings penned these words, that the church was on its last breath, almost ready to die. Some of you have felt that that's been kind of the church in these recent months since the pandemic. The news has been horrific. Churches closing, congregations down, income down, our impact upon society lessened. But when I read that, I was encouraged because shortly after those words were penned, God used Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, to bring a spirit of revival to New England area, a pouring out of God's sovereign Holy Spirit moved amongst people. The messages were so powerful that they said when Jonathan Edwards preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands, of an angry God, people jumped out of their pews and began to put their arms around the calms in fear that they might fall into the pit of hell. Oh, my friends, you and I today, God's church, needs an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit to revive the church, to get us to stand tall again and to make a difference for the Lord. Friends, dark times gives us an opportunity to shine. It did for Jonathan Edwards. It did for George Whitfield. It did for um, John Wesley, Peter Cartwright. And my friends, it will allow us to do the same as it did for these people that we 
are going to look at this morning, or this evening rather, in the book of Judges. The long and sad story of Judges reveals a Deborah, a Balak, a Gideon, a Samson, a Nathaniel, and a Jephthah. The times of Ahab and Jezebel were made illustrious by the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. The dark night of the Middle Ages was made luminous by the testimony of John Wycliffe, Martin Luther, John Knox. They shined in that moment in time. They made a difference. Boy, is it needful for you and I to get to our feet, and stop the nonsense and running about and being full of, of self and begin to shine for Jesus. Let me tell you something. Not only is the church dependent on you to do that, but the world is needing us to do it. The world needs someone to point them to a savior. Samgar's story is short. He is mentioned in only two verses, Judges 3 and 31 and 5 and verse 6. But we can learn much about his shining example by just those couple of scriptures. In the third chapter, 31st verse, the Bible says, And after Ehud came Samgar, son of Anak, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox gourd. He too, the Bible said, saved Israel. Now an ox gourd was an oblong wooden rod with often tipped with a piece of metal. It was used for driving farm animals. Now we're not sure of Samgar's occupation, but we would assume that because he was carrying an ox gourd, that he was a farmer. Now think about that. He was a farmer. He was not a warrior. He was not somebody that was accustomed to going on the battlefield and wielding a sword and a shield. He was a farmer. He was a family man. He was a man that kept to his business and diligently worked hard day in and day out to put food on the table and to pay his bills. And yet God was going to use him. Now listen, if God can use him, why can't he use you? I don't care your occupation. I don't care how far you've gone in school. I don't care your age, the color of your skin. None of that matters. If you just place yourself in a position for God to use you like he did Samgar. Suddenly, this man finds himself confronted by a large group of Philistines, possibly the precursor of another invasion of Israel. Seizing his ox gourd in hand, listen now, he strikes down 600 Philistines. 600 men that were the enemies of Israel. There can be no doubt but that his victory came with the help of God. You see, with God, all things are possible. With God at your side, he gives you a capability that aside from him, you would not have. But with God with you, the possibilities of doing great things for God is exponential. God took control of his chosen instrument. It enabled him to defeat the Philistines and to save his country. From this last phrase, we can assume that Samgar's encounter had a major impact on the country's history. Think about it now. A mere farmer with an ox gourd is changing the direction of a country. Oh, what can one man do? Time and time again in the scriptures, we see what one man can do with God's help. Let's stop using that as an excuse that I'm just one person. What can I do? You can do a great deal with God's help. God enabled him to defeat the enemy. And from that phrase, like I said, Sam Gard's encounter had a major impact on his country's history. No doubt the surviving Philistines went back to tell the tale of their strange disaster. No one would have dared to attack Israel after hearing that only one man with an ox gourd could rout an entire army. 
Wow. Fairy tale, no. Manufactured story, no. A true historical account of what God can do in one man's life to turn the tide and to make a difference. Church, we need to be that one man, that one woman tonight. Sengar represents the spirit of Christian faith and victory. Here we see an ordinary man who met an emergency as it came to him without stepping aside from the path of ordinary duty. When the opportunity came, he took it. When the demand upon him was placed, he stood tall. He did not need to mount a pedestal or be placed in some illustrious position to be a hero. He simply, listen now, he simply stood in the place where God put him and there became a, a claim through the force of his own personal character and conduct. His life spoke volumes. His conduct spoke volumes. Nobody had to cheer him on. He just stood tall when God needed him. He did not go out of his way to find a mission. But he met the events that came to him in the course of his life, turning them into an occasion for faith and victory. What things are emerging in your life? What things are facing you right now? Turn them, my friends, as an opportunity of faith and victory in your heart and life, as this man did. He represents the men and women who stand in secular callings and who find a pulpit and a ministry just where God has placed them amid the task of daily life. You see, every one of us, without exception, are given by God opportunity to make a difference. And the shop that you work, the office you work, the neighborhood you live, the family you interact with. What a tragedy in some cases that I see as a pastor where the unsafe family members have greater influence on you than you do on them. Those unsafe family members, if you don't get them through the doors of God's church and get to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and get saved, they're going to, go, are going to die and go to hell. But every time they have something going on, you forsake church and you run with them and their activities and yet when you invite them to church, they never show. When are we going to make a stand? When are we going to make a difference? Their eternal soul is depending on it. He stands, my friends, for the businessman at his office who finds thousands of opportunities for fighting the battle of the Lord and doing good to his fellow men in the course of his routine. A preacher said he knew a person who repaired shoes. Every day he found himself in his shop with a dozen opportunities for telling others about Jesus Christ. God has used him to lead many of his customers to the personal transfer. Transform, trans, we'll get it out of here. Transformation of coming to Christ and being saved. I know too, a captain on a passenger ship who preaches the gospel in his plain and modest way to thousands of passengers every year. His cabin has become a birthplace of hundreds of Christians. Samgar did not have to wait until he had a sword or a spear or a battle bow to fight. He didn't have to wait. Too many Christians use this as an excuse. Well, I'm just waiting on God. Waiting has become a very convenient excuse to never involve yourself in the work of the Lord. Now, there's nothing wrong with waiting on God to get clear direction. But how long are you going to wait? 
How many years are you going to wait? This man didn't have to wait. He took as a weapon the thing that was in his hand and turned it against the enemy. Similarly, God wants whatever resources that are at your disposal. He asked Exodus 4.2 of Moses, and he asked the same question of you and I, what is that in your hand? What do you have accessible to you right now that God can use to impact lives and to make a difference. Moses had a rod. Dorcas had a needle. Samgar had an ox gourd. David had a sling and stones. Joshua's ram horn. The five, the, the lad's five loaves and two fishes that made a difference to feed a multitude. And the widow's little can of oil are all that he requires for his mightiest victories and his grandest ministries. You see, stop making an excuse because you don't feel yourself uh, immensely talented or gifting. The Lord's asking you this evening, what is in your hand? Because what God has placed in your hand, you can use with God's help to make a difference. Three things that we need to recognize here. Three things that you and I need to do. Give him what you have. I don't know what that might be. It's different for every one of us. But whatever you have, give him what you have. Secondly, be faithful where you are. Right where God has placed you. Be faithful. It's required of a steward that a man be found faithful. But faithful is a commodity that's hard to find today in people. I tell the church that if you're not on vacation or you're sick, you need to be faithful to your post. Some people will never get that, but it takes every one of us being faithful to our post to keep the church strong and to forward the kingdom. So give them what you've got. Be faithful where you are and do what you can. And do what you can. And guess what? God will do the rest. Samgar's victory may seem small compared with Gideon's. If we just look at numbers, we could say that that was true. But the work of God, my friends, is more than a number game. We had a family visit us some months ago that was in my first church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I hadn't seen these folks for uh, probably 42 years, 43 years. The last time I stood before them in that church was 44 years ago. And how delighted I was to have them come and visit us and be in our Sunday morning worship and have a nice dinner with them. The next day I received a, a text from that dear sister. And she said, Pastor Jones, if it had not been for your ministry, I would not be saved. Was there, was there thousands saved in that church? No. But there were people saved, and she happens to be one of them, that after all these years is still serving God. I used what God had given me to touch some lives, and it made a difference. My friends, God will do the rest. And even though we don't have the numbers that Gideon had, it's more than numbers, folks. If we just look at numbers, we could say that this was true, but it's not. But we have to see the larger picture. God used it to prevent a major invasion and to render needless some more costly victory afterwards. Likewise, the little things that we do, the faithfulness with which we meet some trivial opportunity may prevent some greater disaster or be the occasion of some mightier blessing than we can see at this time. Only God knows. But my friends, you being faithful to your post, your position, your life, your walk, your church, your ministry, does, can, and will make a difference when the day is done. It may see a small thing, 
for a woman on a dark and stormy night to dash across the railroad track and signal a rushing train to stop before it crashes into a broken bridge. But that single act of heroism saves a hundred lives. It may seem a little thing for a small group of heroes to hold a pass against an enemy, but that was the key to the whole battle. It may seem trifling for a quiet little English girl to find a ragged street urchin and induce him to go to Sunday school by giving him a suit of clothes. Then when he does not show up, she takes weeks to hunt him down, gives him yet another suit of clothes, invites him yet another time to come to Sunday school. He doesn't come again. She hunts him down a third time, gives him a suit of clothes again, and finally he comes. Her patience paid off. And the boy was one to Christ. To most, it was a small thing. They certainly felt the boy was not worth pursuing. But the day came when that act of tireless love was God's first step in the evangelization of China in that day and hour. That boy was Robert Morrison, the pioneer of modern missions in the Far East. Who knows the potential that resides in that boy, that girl, that man, that woman, that God has placed across our path in life that you and I can impact and make a difference in. These are the little things that God loves to glorify. I pray that he will help us watch for those wayside opportunities and win those battles of faith and fortitude when they come. Because my friend, listen to me, you can and you will, by God's help, make a difference. We're going to pick this up next week. You will not want to miss. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you can use the unknown, the small person in the eyes of society to make an impact and to make a difference, God, in the larger picture of God in the future. Lord, this morning, this evening, rather, make us to realize how much we can make a difference if we just place our life in your hands. Right where we're at, God, to impact those of the shop, the office, the neighborhood, our own homes, our own church. God challenge us with that potential. And may God, we stand tall, move forward, and be doggedly determined to make a difference as we yield ourselves fully and completely to you. And stop using the worn out excuse that I'm just waiting on God. It's time now to stop waiting, to stand up and be used. And I pray that you will. Father, be with us until we meet again. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining with us tonight. I pray that once again, I've given you something to think about, something to chew on. I pray that the Lord has used me to challenge you. And that you might be the next Samgar that will stand up and make an enormous difference even when nobody else does. Have a blessed rest of the week until I see you again. Amen.